بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان اعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانهر ان شانك هو الافطر and we always want to start with the prayer and the prayer of today is allahumma ahsan aqibatana fil umur kullaha wa ajarna min khazi dunya wa azab al akhira o allah taala may all my things end in good my end good in something glorified and allah taala save me from humiliation of this world and the world hereafter Amen. very welcome to the dyslipidemia dvia module uh, we uh, two three weeks ago we had a wonderful talk by professor khawar kazmi and in that dyslipidemia module we tried to establish the role of cholesterol as a one of the risk factors and uh, today we have a very learned speaker professor solat siddiqui solat siddiqui um, has been the head of uh, 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 of uh, um, um, sheikh zaid cardiology department not the head as such but the probably the architect of that department which has contributed so much in so many ways uh, to the progress of cardiology in lahore and in the form of amber malik and kazi sabur and they've all contributed immensely <laughs> uh the stylish gentleman that he is with his immaculate manners uh, solat siddiqui is a uh, heartthrob of lots and lots of people he is currently the president of pakistan hypertension league and we are very lucky to be joined by two very distinguished panelists uh, dr bilal mohyuddin and everybody knows bilal mohyuddin uh, the head of department of cardiology at ke medical um, university and he is uh, what i call as a single man army uh, what an army cannot do uh, bilal can do and if you remember he used to conduct heart uh, uh, talks at pic in a wonderful way and even uh, he hosted a pakistan cardiac society meeting at that time he is the general secretary of pakistan cardiac society and third uh, we have is uh, momin salahuddin momin salahuddin is a professor of cardiology at rmi a very distinguished cardiologist uh, who sits on lots of boards and international cardiologists leading his way up and up uh, before we start uh, i'm going to uh, start with uh, uh, mcqs and with mcqs we will give you 2 minutes we have got 6 mcqs and we will let you uh, make up your mind and then we'll show you uh, uh, the, the mcqs so this mcqs i hope you can see it now can you see mcqs yes sir i can yes okay. i think um, sara sahab is sharing his slide so that is why so i can share karu phir i probably you'll have to go on sharing okay how do i do that that's the question uh Okay. okay. Sir, we can Thank see you. now. Sir, we can see now. You, you can, can see, see now. Me? Yeah, now it is there. Right. Okay. So now you've got MCQs in front of you. There are six MCQs, and you have exactly uh, two minutes uh, to uh, answer these questions. Sorry, I, I can't see anything. I can see it. How about Bilal Sir? Can you see anything? I can see the MCQs. Perfect. Okay, I, I I'm just seeing uh, solid stuff. Yes, uh, I, I can see them also. Um, Good. They seem to come and go. Um, you see, if you stay on this panel where you've got slides for dyslipidemia, there doesn't. Show, uh, People are answering. People are answering yeah. right now. So let's. uh this way they are like yes, uh, uh, i i started seeing them and then i wanted to make a comment and unmute myself then it disappeared now i can't get them back so there's a way there must be a way of bring them on and off let me there are about 143 participants most of them are saying that we can see it um and sir ye sare nahi aa rahe saal sir ha chali theek hai slide we we trail them up we we have to scroll it we have to scroll it up 
Vishab, I I Did saw you? them and now I can't see them. They seem to have disappeared. Okay, uh, you can't see them as well. Uh, there is uh, uh, lots of people who are answering. I can see them. Yes. So let it. Let's run this one. Just and then yeah. we, we ah, sort out later. But again. they came yeah, initially, but, and then they when I tried to unmute myself, they disappeared. Dr. Umair Saman says that he has seen all of them and answered all of them. Okay, I, can see them I will wait for moment. another 30 seconds. Okay. okay what you need to do is uh, you click that and you click on the top one which says poll and quizzes and that's where they come. Yeah, I press the uh, icon of quizzes. That's right. Yes, go to the bottom right, which says 11 or and more, and they've got some three dots there. Press on them, and the first one is polls and quizzes. You play, click on them, and then you answer. You can see all the, the things, you can scroll up and down these yeah, questions. Th this is not 11, it's, it, this is a graph that shows itself. Please click on the polls and quizzes on the bottom line and you'll be able to see. We will show them again as well at the end of the lecture. Last 15 seconds. Okay, so I will... Um, it's about 31 people have answered the poll. Uh, let me share with you the result of poll. And then we will look at it again after we have finished the lecture. So uh, <clears throat> minimal to cholesterol, uh, most 44% people think it is 38 uh, and uh, uh, only 10% think it's 18. Uh, which was the first study to show benefit in secondary prevention. 42% uh, people believe it was the lipid study. Uh, what is the minimum percentage reduction in LDLC, which decreases MACE? And 30% uh, believe it is uh, 30, sorry, 54% believe it is 30%. And 42% believe it is 40%. So there is a dichotomy in this. Uh, what was the first major study to suggest the plaque, plaque stabilization of a statin? And 50% people believe it is prove it, something it is care, something it is TNT. Uh, and the fifth question was, which is the lowest LDLC recommended by an international guideline? And 54% uh, people believe 70%, 25, 55, and 24%, uh, uh, sorry, zero people believe it's 30 milligram. And which study has shown evidence of significant benefit with statin over more than 10 years? And 26 people believe it is WASCOP, 22, IDEAL, 17, ALHAT, and Jupiter, 35%. So uh, the stage is set that the questions have been answered and there is a, a lot of, uh, 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 if I may use the word confusion about the correct answer because people have been answering left or right. So we very eagerly look forward to the presentation of Professor Solat Siddiq and hopefully all these uh, doubts will be clarified. Professor Solat. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fizullah for a very nice uh, introductory session, I would say. Uh, so uh, I will start with my talk. Uh, I'm uh, honored uh, to uh, say thanks to 
General Saab and, and uh, Professor Afiz and the Academic Council of the Pakistan so uh, Cardiac Society for uh, asking me to present this. Uh, this dyslipidemia module is over six lectures, so mine is only about how effective is prevention, and my talk is basically would be about statins because that is the main uh, thrust of prevention, whether it's primary or secondary. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we start with just a brief introduction about just a revision of what li lipoproteins are basically, and we have the large molecules, the chylomicrons and the remnants, and then the LDL, both the small dense particle <clears throat> and the normal LDL, and then the HDL, which is the smallest. So we'll only be talking now of LDL, basically. And we know <clears throat> the importance of LDL because this high plasma LDL leads to infiltration into the intima, which starts the process of formation of the fatty streak and ultimately full-blown atherosclerosis. On the other hand, the HDL is the good cholesterol, which can take away the LDL from the bloodstream into the liver and then ultimately excrete it into the bile in the form of cholesterol. Why is LDL important? What's the proof here? This is the Interheart study, which studied nine major uh, factors, lifestyle factors and other factors contributing to the first myocardial infarction. And you can see here that the single most important factor is lipids, the single most common factor in all these studies. And this was a very diverse study which has a lot of uh, South Asian and especially Pakistani population. So what are the various lipids? Just a brief thing. We have the total cholesterol, which is the fat ester, and then the LDL, which is the so-called bad cholesterol, the HDL, so-called good cholesterol, and then triglycerides, which are the actual fat. The main concentration will be on LDL. What are their effects? Well, each one milligram rise in LDL-C increases mortality by approximately 1%, while each milligram rise in HDL-C decreases mortality by 2% of roughly. Triglycerides are important, but not as much as the cholesterols are, and they are mostly an independent risk factor in females. But significantly high triglycerides uh, can precipitate acute pancreatitis, so that's their importance. Just a brief look at the normal values. We have total cholesterol less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, LDL less than 130, HDL in males greater than 40, and in females greater than 50 while triglycerides are less than 150. And here's the answer to the first question, one millimole of per liter of cholesterol is equal to 38.67. So I think most of the people got that right. This uh, is, is a uh, graph which shows the level of LDL cholesterol in milligrams per deciliter versus the log scale of the relative risk of coronary heart disease and it's a very linear relationship the greater the cholesterol level in the blood the worse the risk for heart disease and that is why we are concentrating on the ldl target levels for ldl <clears throat> normal preparation is less than 130 as already mentioned low risk patients is less than 116 milligrams 116 Moderate risk classified as the Framingham risk score 7.5 to 19.9. 10 year risk is less than 100 milligrams. The high risk, which is greater than 20% score or the presence of diabetes, is less than 70 milligrams. And the very high risk, those who have established vascular disease already in any circulation or the presence of diabetes mellitus with multiple other risk factors or an LDLC of greater than 190, the target is less than 55 milligrams per deciliter. There is one other special condition, which is the two or more vascular events within two years of each other, despite adequate LDLC lowering, and then the target shifts to less than 40. So here we have the answer to this, that question also. Now, the other uh, right-hand 
<coughs> column gives you uh, the percentage reduction because now there are two ways of uh, targeting LDL. One is an absolute target, which is the figures, and then there is a uh, 30 percent or a 50 percent decrease from the initial level. Uh, the Americans mostly follow this pathway. So I've mentioned both. In this case, the moderate risk, you have to lower by greater than 30%, while all the high risk, very high risk, et cetera, come in the greater than 50% reduction from the original level. Now we're going to talk of prevention. And obviously, prevention starts with lifestyle modifications, diet, avoidance of animal fats and reduction in total calories fortunately has a very little effect it's only a 5 to 10 percent reduction in ldl and similarly a 5 to 10 percent increase in hdl but it does have a marked effect on triglycerides the next, next is exercise and the recommended is a brisk walk of at least 210 minutes per week so it's 30 minutes every day of the week Again, a very mild effect on LDLC. In fact, less than 5%. And uh, however, it does increase HDL uh, up to about 10% or more. Again, a marked reduction in triglycerides can be seen. Smoking has to be a complete cessation and it definitely affects the level of HDL improving it. Obesity, <clears throat> you have to optimize the weight. The reduction in obese patients is about 0.8 milligrams per deciliter of LDL. And similarly, an increase of 0.4 milligrams per deciliter in HDL. Again, the obese, a marked reduction in triglycerides can be seen. Blood sugar control is essential to normal the triglycerides. It doesn't affect the LDL or HDL. The drugs for lowering LDL are quite a few, but I'm going only to talk about the statins in this uh, talk. Uh, there's niacin in addition, bile acid sequestrants like cholestyramine, azetamide. The new kids on the block are the PC PCSK9 inhibitor, bampedoic acid, and then there is inclisiran which works even at uh, a more proximal stage to the PCSK9 and stops the production of PCSK9. Drugs for increasing HDL? Well, as the slide shows, we have drawn a blank here. There is no such drug. Drugs for lowering triglycerides, we have phenofibrates, bisafibrates, and omega-3 fatty acids. And now I come to the main topic today is statins in prevention. <clears throat> How do the statins work? They inhibit the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway at the level of the conversion from H, uh, HMGCO to mevalonate. And this is where it works. And the ultimate sequel, uh, consequences that you reduce the LDL cholesterol. So as the reduction in hepatic cholesterol synthesis lowers intracellular cholesterol, then which it stimulates the upregulation of the LDL receptor and increases uptake of non-HDL particles from the systemic circulation, thus lowering the levels in the blood. <clears throat> There have been a number of studies, both in primary prevention and secondary prevention, and secondary prevention further into acute coronary syndromes and chronic coronary heart disease listed in this slide. And you see that the first study, the 4S study, was presented in 1994. And then there has been a huge rush in all kinds of uh, prevention. Uh, and we'll go through these one by one. <clears throat> So we'll start with the secondary prevention because the 4S was basically a secondary prevention study. And I'll uh, talk about the primary prevention studies later on. So this was the first study it's in 4,444 patients. 
and they were given simvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams or placebo for four for 5.4 years and there was a marked reduction a 30 percent reduction in mortality over this period so this the study for the first time proved that a statin provides significant benefit in those with very high ldlc levels here i would like to mention that there was no prior drug prior to the statins which lowered the ldl by 30 percent previous drugs had a maximum benefit of about 15 to 18 percent maximum so then none of them actually achieved significant clinical reductions in uh, endpoints the only study prior to the statins was the posh ileal bypass study which reduced cholesterol but that was a very long study i think it was over a decade and that showed reduction because it reduced cholesterol by 30 percent but that could not be practiced in the normal population so see that was just a one-off study but statins are the first drug which lowered by 30 percent and thereby had a good effect and this answers the other question also the case study was followed up this was in 1996 again 4000 plus patients with a history of mi and this uh, used travastatin versus placebo for five years again and the rate of mi or chd death there was a 24 percent reduction so again it proved that statin provides significant benefit in those with average cholesterol levels I forgot to mention that in the 4s study the ldl cholesterol was close to 190 and that was reduced to about 130 plus in this the starting cholesterol was about 155 in the care study so we, as we go uh, along we'll find that the levels keep getting lower and lower then comes the lipid study which is 9000 patients uh, with mi hospitalization for unstable angina again using prevastatin versus placebo for six years chd death being the primary endpoint and this again had a lower cholesterol level again and it again showed that there was a 24 percent risk reduction with a p-value of 0 0.0001 less than then comes the miracle trial the miracle trial was in acute coronary syndrome so this is the first time uh, we went from stable coronary heart disease to a, a, an acute scenario they said about 3000 patients and the follow-up period was only 16 weeks now that's a major difference or two major differences in this study one the acute uh, nature of the patient and then the short follow-up period as compared to the five to six years of the previous uh, studies. Again, even at this, in this short study, you can see 16% uh, risk reduction uh, between placebo and atorvastatin. And uh, thereby the concept of plaque stabilization came in here. This was the first major study to prove this, that or at least suggest this that you have this feature in the statins that they will uh, stabilize the plaque because otherwise uh, all the previous studies had never shown more than a two to three percent reduction in the atheroma size yet they were benefiting in less mace events so this study proved the point that acute intensive statin therapy provides significant cv benefit with prox stabilization probably as the main stay <clears throat> then came the heart protection study now in this study it is important to see that you had various level of baseline ldl so see not the ultimate target but the baseline so you have a less than 100 milligram 100 and 100 to 129 and then greater than 130 and you can see that all these irrespective of the baseline cholesterol they had a similar almost reduction from <clears throat> uh, in the events so this proved again because it, each of these studies is basically uh, pioneering in its own self uh, something new 
that simvastatin provides significant CV benefit regardless of the baseline LDLC. And again, we come to the point that about a 30% reduction, irrespective of the baseline LDL cholesterol, you can get benefits in clinical events. Then came the prove it study. This was in 2004. And now you have a comparison between two statins. One, a moderate statin, which is pravastatin, versus a high intensity statin, which is a torvastatin. And this now proved that you have to give intensive statins to achieve even better results than the previous ones achieved with just a moderate statin. So you have a 16% redu risk reduction over roughly a two and a half year period. <clears throat> the PROSPER study came in 2002, and this was in the elderly. So you have the age group of 70 to 82 years and using pravastatin 40 milligram versus placebo. There was a 15% risk reduction, which was significant. Of course, at this age group, the effects will not be that marked in prevention because they already have established disease. And therefore you can see that the curves dif differ very little, but still significant. So it does work, although less effective. Then taking uh, this study, which is the TNT treating to new targets trial, <clears throat> 10,000 patients with stable CHD, randomized to a torvastatin 80 versus a torvastatin 10. And this again shows that there is increasing the uh, um, amount of statin, the same statin now, you get high intensity statin working better than the low intensity similar statin. Now, this is an important uh, graph comparing the various study. And what I would like to show here is whether you take the 4S, which starts about 190 and goes up to about 125. This is about a 30% reduction. Or you take the lipid, it starts at about 150 plus and goes to about 110. Again, a 30% reduction. Care starts at about 135 and goes down to about 95. So each of these studies, HPS again, when you reduce the cholesterol by 30% roughly, you get even uh, reduction. <clears throat> and these are secondary all secondary prevention trials. Now, what about the primary prevention trials? The Voskop study was the first one, and it came soon after the 4S study. That was in 1994. So this was presented in 1995. And this was 6,500 plus men with moderate hypercholesterolemia randomized to pravastatin 40 milligram versus placebo for five years. Again, 31% significant risk reduction in the rate of MI, coronary heart disease death. And it proved that even without the presence of established vascular disease, you can benefit with, uh, with the use of a statin in high risk people. Now the Voskop study was then had a long term for, uh, later on follow up with, at five and ten years after, in fact, uh, up to fifteen years of total follow up. I'm sorry, the slide doesn't present very well, uh, but it proved that irrespective of the time period, ten years, total of fifteen years, you can get an eighteen percent reduction at ten years and a twenty seven percent reduction, all significant with the use of a statin for a prolonged period. And again, this is one of the questions and the answers. I think many people got it correct. <clears throat> the FCAPs, uh, oblique death caps, these were the next uh, study in presenting, uh, presented in 1998, and six and a half thousand plus patients with average LDL cholesterols, randomized to lower statin, which is now not available. 20 to 40 milligrams. And again, uh, significant reduction, 37%, uh, even in those with moderate LDL cholesterol levels 
and no established uh, uh, vascular disease. We have the next study is the 2003 presentation of the Escort lipid lowering arm. And this had 10,000 plus patients with hypertension randomized to a Torvastat in 10 milligram or placebo. And now look at the level uh, we, we achieved, which the Torvastat in 19 and placebo 126 milligrams. And you had cumulative incidence, which is significant 37, 36% reduction. So a statin provides significant benefit in moderate to high risk individuals by lowering LDLC levels below the current goals. Now those were the current goals at that time was <clears throat> the Jupiter study came out in 2008. And this uh, was an interesting study in the fact that it had a lot of uh, patients in it, uh, 17, almost 18,000 patients with LDLC starting at less than 130, you know, which is considered as normal. And these were normal people, not patients as such, but they had a high sensitive CRP greater than two milligrams. And they were treated with rosuvastatin or plus versus placebo. So even with just this one other risk factor of a high, or relatively high, I would say CRP, uh, statin provided significant benefit to those with normal LDLC. And you can see that the significant levels is 0 0.00001. And you just need to treat 25 patients to get the benefit of one major adverse cardiovascular event. And we have the HOPE study. <clears throat> This was done in uh, intermediate risk population without cardiovascular disease. And it had uh, four arms basically, the BP lowering with combined candesartan and hydrochlorothiazide, a cholesterol lowering arm with rosuvastatin. Then we had a combined BP and cholesterol lowering arm and then a placebo arm total. So four arms and so 12,000 patients, roughly 3,000 in each of the arms. And you can see here that there was a significant reduction, 0 0.002, in the one which compared rosuvastatin versus placebo, but a non-significant reduction in the one where candesartan and hydrochlorothiazide was compared versus placebo. So 0 0.040. So the conclusion was that fixed dose treatment with low dose statin therapy, but not hypertensive agents, was superior to placebo in reducing long term cardiovascular events in an intermediate risk population with hypertension. The combination group did best. I will go back now to the UK PDS study, if people remember it that proved for the first time that treating the hypertension got better results than treating the diabetes itself. In this, that treating the, uh, with the statin got better results than treating with an antihypertensive. So now if you can just correlate it, it seems that the single best, and this correlates with the inter-heart study, that the single best way to reduce events is to use a statin. This is a similar graph to the one for the secondary prevention. And again, it shows that whether you start at a very high level as in VOSCOPs and reduce it by 30% or moderate level in FCAPs and reduce it by 30% or a relatively low level with escort and then reduce it further by 30%, in each of that, you get a significant benefit. And again, the percentage is about 30% in each of these trials. So here's a graph from the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration published in the Lancet in 2010. And you can see that if you start at 3.5, 
five millimoles and reduce it by 21%, which is down to about 2.5, you get a 21% relative risk reduction. Reduce it further by another 0.5 millimole, which is about 19 milligrams per deciliter. You get another 16% relative risk reduction. And then reduce it further by another 19 milligrams or 0.5 millimoles, and you get further five-way risk reduction of a major cardiovascular event. So the ultimate point being presented in this cartoonish style slide that whether you lower it to about 120 plus or 100 milligrams or 90 or 60 something or even down and now with Odyssey, which is using PCS SK9, each of them shows that you keep on lowering the LDLC, LDLC and you keep on getting the cardiovascular benefits. So there is no lower limit so far. After almost 25 years of uh, treating with LDL, uh, with statins, we have this now uh, that high is bad, average is not good, lower is better, even lower is even better. And probably the lowest LDLC targets that you can achieve may turn out to be the best. I have one other point to convey, which is the concept of cumulative cholesterol lifetime exposure. Now, just to give an example, uh, when we take the history of a patient, we talk, if he's a smoker, we ask him, what is his current smoking status? So let's say he takes half a pack a day. But we also would like to know what was his total cumulative exposure to smoking, which is your pack years. So we always try to write in the history that he had 3% elevated transaminases. Again, this is a dose-dependent phenomena that is usually reversible. So not a very important side effect. I'm what about my LCS? <laughs> well, the net effect actually is in the negative. There was more incidence in the control arm because myalgia is such a common symptom, especially in the elderly. And what about myositis, which is a more serious effect? Again, 0.9 minus the 0.4 seen in the control arms, you just have a net effect of 0.5%. And rhabdomyolysis, 0.2, and then 0.1 in the control arms, this is a net effect of 0.1%. Now, in another, <clears throat> I'll skip this one the rest of time. So in the final study, which is accumulation of all these, they found that typically treating 10,000 patients for five years, that's about 50,000 patient years of statin, you reduce major vascular events in secondary prevention by about 10,000 and primary prevention 500. And this treatment of 50,000 patient years, you will end up with about five cases of myositis oblique rhabdomyolysis, 50 to 100 new cases of diabetes, five to 10 hemorrhagic strokes. And this is only seen in those with prior stroke. And 50 to 100 patients experience symptomatic adverse effects of myalgias. The rest basically are mostly similar, but all due to nocebo effect. And there was important in the last uh, line, no evidence to support adverse effects like cognif on cogn cognitive function, significant renal deterioration, risk of cataract, risk of hemorrhagic stroke in patients without prior stroke. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Wonderful. Uh, very, very nicely, completely covered topic. Uh, let me go to the polls once again. So you, uh, uh, this was the result last time. Uh, can the host play it again now? You have uh, uh, questions in front of you. Please press uh, this polls quizzes at the end uh, on, on, the, on the bottom line and you will see the questions. The time starts now.
Can you all see it? Okay, now you can see it. There are six questions in total. We have already had one go at them. So you should be able to do it nicely now. While they're discussing these questions, um, may I make a small comment, sir? Uh, let them finish and then, uh, of course, we will come to you directly. Let them concentrate, scratch their head. Please, to get onto the polls, go onto the bottom line. It says polls, quizzes. Click on that and you will get the poll. Only 32 people have so far attempted the question answer. Last 15 seconds. Okay. I'm afraid only 30, 40 people have I'll, I'll wait for a few more seconds because there are other people who are attempting. We've reached 53. Uh, yeah, 54. Mm. So it's, it's, I, I think people are finding it now. Okay, so I think this is uh, 8.55. So I will end the poll. Here. 10 seconds more. 10 seconds more, we're second still ball. coming. Okay. Please click on the link called polls and quizzes on the bottom line. Okay, I will end it over here. I think we can go to discussion now. Yeah. Just yes. give me one minute. So the results. Uh, so let you want to sort of talk about it. Briefly? I think uh, the first question is. Uh, I think 30. most of them yeah. have put it correctly. Sixty-five percent. Yeah. Which is thirty-eight. Uh, and uh, this, I'm afraid, uh, the second question is, uh, people are still confused about which study. It was the HPS study, which was the one which showed less than 100 milligram deciliter. Okay. Third? Uh, minimum percentage, I think. <clears throat> Most of them have got it correctly, which is 30%. Uh, this, I'm afraid, totally wrong. This is question number four. It was the miracle study, and I did point out in the slide. And uh, again, 
70 milligrams is generally for most patients, but did mention a specific category of patient, and this is from the ESC guidelines, which uh, mention two events in within two years, despite adequate uh, therapy, uh, you go to less than 40 milligrams. So it's an international guideline and it is a specific, but it is mentioned. So I, that was the good question, basically. And finally, this one, I think question number six for SCOPS is the one which went to up to 15 years. So that's fine. Excellent. So, uh, uh, Professor Bilal Mayuddin, for your comments. Um, <clears throat> firstly, uh, may I thank uh, the, the organizers and everyone for putting up this uh, thing, and especially for, uh, Professor Swale and Professor Fisa for taking the initiative of getting um, this thing going on. Indeed, it is always a privilege to be part of such programs and um, to be able to uh, give in your own input. Um, the, this question about the lowest statin, Sonasa was very kind in explaining it, but then he also said that, you know, there's no lower limit. So probably some people who clicked on the 30%, probably they went for the no lower limit. And uh, this keeps on going into this uh, whole thing. And a little bit of clinical personal experiences that a few of my patients have dropped it down to well below 30 and they don't have any side effects and they're doing quite well even with a very low dose of statin as the statins have been tapered. Uh, one thing that I would like all the audience who has gone through this whole thing um, very carefully is that they must have noticed that the graphs were, as they were shown, they had a split very early. So you start making a difference very early. And the moment the statin therapy comes on, uh, within three to six months, a difference does start happening uh, and com compared to those who are not taking a statin. Um, into a, in, a, in a required dosage. So that must be done. Then uh, you need to uh, monitor your statins, but then there is always this debate how much monitoring and how frequently the monitoring should be done. Once you have your targets achieved, my normal practice is anything between six weeks to 12 weeks, I do a reanalysis because by that time, we, uh, the patient sort of develops a habit of taking the medicine and from there we can um, move on. One thing, again, we all need to remember is that all this about statins and everything and atherosclerosis remains regarding the atherosclerotic part of the coronary artery disease. This, is, this will not cover as far as the non-atherotic atherosclerotic part, that, that way, meaning the anemic part, the type 2 infarctions, which a lot of us have seen many a times. So it is not as an absolute preventer, but it is one which is there, which is very much. Um, one thing that I would uh, beg to differ with a lot of people uh, is uh, what um, Solasab has also uh, said is about this pack year business. I unfortunately uh, do not agree with this pack year business. I prefer to count uh, the number of sticks consumed by a person and the number of years the sticks have been consumed. Because actually, in my humble opinion, this pack year, one pack year or two pack year, is a designed fashion by the smoke industry in order to um, downgrade the fact that you are smoking 20 cigarettes per day. And packs, as far as concerned, is the most interesting fact that those of us who have seen these various packs, there are packs of 10, and then there was once a mega pack of 30 also introduced. So these packs become a different way of looking at things. So my request is that um, to all the teachers over here is that please stop this pack year business, go to the number of sticks cons consumed by a person every day, because that creates, you see, if you are saying that I'm just going 10 kilometers over speed, yeah. rather than saying that I'm going so much, so it's, it's just about that kind of a thing. As such, Solasa mm -hmm. has, as always, has been a fantastic teacher. I've enjoyed yeah. his lectures so many times. And um, his ability to actually hold hands of the students and take them forward is immense. And I think he has done a fantastic, fantastic job as always. And so Thank hats you. off to you as always. Thank you. Professor Momin Salauddin. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Professor uh, Salat Saab, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, uh, lecture full of awareness. Uh, a couple of points I would like to make. One is about the primary. Uh, I think uh, for the last two years or so, a uh, lot of debate has been going on about the 
a role of cholesterol in primary prevention, especially in social media, where the misconception is being created, um, talking about meta-analysis and saying that there's no role of cholesterol uh, management in primary prevention. So this almost totally negates everything <clears throat> which has been spread, falsely spread. Um, uh, in fact, I would probably add that uh, nowadays they say that as early as five or six years of age, the children that we call bubbly and chubby children, and in fact, they are uh, high risk for future potential cerebral vascular events. So I think it's uh, the cholesterol thing starts as early as that. Uh, one point that I would like to make and ask in the panel, um, it, when it comes to primary prevention, when do you recommend to start the statin therapy? Say people do come into in, in clinic and they ask whether they should start statins. So what's your recommendation for that? Thank you. Uh, Professor Bashir Hanif, are you online? Yes, I am. Yes, please. C can you answer this question? How, when, how early do you start uh, statins uh, for primary prevention and patients with high cholest cholesterol? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, excellent talk by uh, Dr. Salat, as always. Um, great overview. Uh, just uh, two quick comments, and then I'll answer your question. One is, you know, it's really sad to see uh, that so many even uh, cardiologists, let alone general internists, still don't prescribe um, high dose statin despite patient is having significant coronary artery disease. And yesterday I saw a patient, and so I was really one of the most senior cardiologists in town, who is a 40-year-old guy who had um, um, ACS, LED lesion was stented, and he had like moderate disease in the right and circ, and um, uh, he came back again, was having symptoms and they had a cath again and that moderate disease in the circ and the right had become severe. And I was looking at his medications and after the first, in the first pres prescription, he was not on statins. And I asked him, why did you not take it? Was there a problem? He said that senior cardiologist said that I don't believe in statins. So that was really very, very interesting to me that as a cardiologist, even there are who don't believe and even if they believe they have put them on Rusua statin, 5 milligram or 10 milligram of Atorva statin, somebody who has severe critical coronary artery disease, and that's what's been happening. So I think we need to really educate and these kind of um, uh, webinars and sessions hopefully will help and make sure. I have seen so many times I put them on high dose statin, the patient will come back, he went to somebody else, and he decreased the dose because your cholesterol is normal. So that's, that's the major problem. No, regarding when would I start for primary prevention, I always try to um, look, obviously, well, if somebody is diabetic or underlying vascular disease, it doesn't have to be quote and quote, quote coronary disease, even carotid disease or peripheral vascular disease, then I don't have to worry about it. But for primary prevention, I always try to um, find out the risk score. And uh, as per guidelines, if LDL is more than 190, um then you don't have to calculate the risk score then you need to start them on statin but if it is less than 190 i always calculate the risk score and if the risk score is high then i would uh, proceed with the statins even in those patients thank you yes yes please uh, I think uh, that's Bilal's point regarding how uh, low is low uh, the question was very specific in mentioning an international guideline see uh, the lower is better and lowest is bad is our statements without an international guideline to back them. So the level is less than 40 only by the ESC. EHA uh, have not even reached that level as yet. Uh, the second point, uh, the major discussion point is how, when do you start? I think all the guidelines mention that when you have a low risk patient and they want to get on a statin or ask about a statin, then it has to be individualized and discussed with the patient. And that discussion would then take their family history into account, their risk score into account. And after discussion, some would say yes and some would say no. So it basically would depend on the patient ultimately or the subject at that time on when or how anxious they are about using it 
whether plus or whether negative. So it, it is really a discussion and the, the patient ultimately decides for you rather than you, you just give them the all, all the facts. So that's how Thank most you. people will manage it. Thank you. Uh, it, it remains to me that we are well in time. I'm very happy about it that we could cover up the whole thing in about one hour and eight minutes. Uh, my profound thanks to Farmivo for organizing this whole academic activity. They've been very generous with this uh, th thing. Uh, great big thanks to Pakistan Cardiac Society uh, Academic Council who hosted this function. And uh, I remind you that the next is going to be more interesting. Mm -hmm.